Uh, sorry. Uh, good. So she she uh, is a fellow recovering administrator, uh, having recently uh, finished a five year term as uh, uh, vice provost and dean of research, where her purview was very broad, including uh, data science initiatives, managing Slack's relationship with the DOE, I'm sure a trivial task, and standing up Stanford's new uh, School of Sustainability, for which she served as the transition dean in 2022. For the past several years, she's been co-chair of the National uh, Quantum Initiative Advisory Committee within the White House uh, OSTP. Uh, she's an excellent lecturer. We know that because in 2004, she came here uh, and gave a series of three uh, Lee Page lectures. And uh, it's the only one so far in recorded history where the audience has got bigger and bigger with each lecture. Uh, so during this visit, unfortunately, she's only giving us one lecture, but uh, we're glad to have that. And please join me in welcoming Cam to the Yale Physics. Thank you, Steve, for that very nice introduction. And I'm really happy to be here. I just stopped being an administrator on October 2nd. And coming here is a really wonderful way for me to start being a full-time scientist for the year. Um, I've already learned things today. And I've always learned things in every previous visit I've ever made to Yale. So I don't know, is it a tradition to interrupt when people have questions or comments? Um, yes. I'd like to I'd like to invite people to interrupt if you have questions or comments because as I say I always learn something when I come to Yale. I also want to mention those Lee Page Prize lectures. I want to kind of thank the whole department leadership here, especially Shankar, um, for that visit that I came here because I was uh, I was a relatively new mom with um, twin toddlers, and uh, I was really grappling with how to balance uh, family life and work life and being a lab person. Um, and you did this amazing thing, which was, I guess, usually for the Leap Page prize lectures, usually you have a limo, take the person to a Broadway show. And I was like, Broadway show? I'm running a lab and I have twin toddlers, you know? <laughs> and um, instead you arranged for a limo to take my toddlers and me to ride on a train. So it was extremely cool and really, it really made me feel good about being a physicist, so thank you. Um, but what I'm here to talk about today is, uh-oh, hmm. this stopped working. Um, so I'm gonna, s nope, hmm. but I, there we go, excellent. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I wanna talk about exploring quantized flux insights into superconductivity. And at first I thought I would take you on a tour of a lot of really cool things, but when I tried to put it together, it got too confusing. So I'm trying to just concentrate on two so that I can convey the sense of quantum materials today. I think all of us in the room here today know that um, phase coherence um, is a major signature of quantum mechanics. The wave function obviously has both a magnitude and a phase. Um, and you know the fact that the um, structure of atomic orbitals is solving a differential equation involving a complex number is a big part of why atomic structure is the way it is. So in some sense, the um, you know the fact that atomic orbitals are quantized is always already a very strong argument for the wave-like nature of the electron. It's also the case, the image on the right is the uh, artist's conception that I found on the web of a uh, quantum computing qubit. Um, and you know it's also the case that coherence between different states, and also entanglement, which is basically coherence between the states of different qubits, is very, very important to studying uh, quantum computing. So I think all of us as physicists were very familiar with the concept of phases and the concept of phase coherence. And um, you know, as the co-chair of the National Quantum Initiative Advisory Committee, I sometimes have to answer the question, so what is quantum anyway? <laughs> um, and as you know, it's a very, as you can imagine, it's a very hard question to answer. But a lot of us like to think of it as being basically like when the phase is important, that's one way to think about quantum. It's not the only way to think about it, but it's one way to think about it. But when I'm looking for something to be wave-like, I'm really looking for something more like this. When you talk to me about something being a wave, I'm really looking to see interference. Um, and you know, you, you this these two uh, canoeists, kayakers, 
um, not only create ripples, but you can see the beautiful interference between the ripples, the waves that are emanating from their two different boats. And so I think many people would say that interference is really the clearest hallmark of a wave-like nature of something. Um, I want to argue that in the, in the case of the wave-like nature of electrons and solid materials, um, while there are tools available for imaging interference that occurs spatially, there are also other tools for checking for this kind of interference. Um, and it can be actually quite difficult and challenging to do spatial imaging of interference for uh, electrons that are, that are in a solid material. Um, so probably the most common, one of the most common ways that we use um, goes back to a paper by Aharonov and Baum. Uh, I don't know if you, if you do, do you teach Aharonov Baum effect in your uh, undergrad quantum or first year grad quantum or both? Both? Okay, yeah, good, nice. See, most places don't do that. <laughs> Most places actually, if I give a colloquium and talk about the Aharonov Bohm effect for many graduate students, it's the first time they've heard of it. But you all are all comfortable with it, right? Aharonov Bohm effect? Yeah, okay. So if you, it's good that you're comfortable with it because there's a theory of giving talks that says that the first third of the talk, everybody should understand. The second third of the talk, only the expert should understand. And the last third of the talk, nobody should understand, not even the speaker. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm sort of going to go through that cycle a couple of times, probably. Um, OK, so um, as you know, then, um, if you think of the Hamiltonian as a charged particle and what happens to an electron beam that gets split by a metal foil like this into two different paths, if you imagine the left path, the left path acquires a phase that is proportional to the magnetic flux in the center of the path and the charge of, well, in this case, it's an electron, but it could be any charged particle. Um, and then the right path acquires an equal and opposite phase, and therefore you get either constructive or destructive interference. So looking at something like this while tweaking the magnetic field really can be just as good as doing a double slit experiment. This is essentially a double slit experiment, but instead of tuning the location, you're just tuning the magnetic flux. And so this is something, this is the kind of interference experiment that you can really do in devices and materials without needing to get there and image the spatial pattern of where the electrons are. As I mentioned here, I, I called this an electron because I'm I just the, the, the picture from Aharonov and Bohm's original paper says this is an electron beam and therefore the charge would be charge E. Um, but in principle, the flux quantum depends on the charge carriers. So it could be H over E, H over 2E, or H over you know, 6E if you have some object that has 6E charge. OK, another effect of this, uh, uh, this, this effect uh, also applies not just when you have two beams going in two different directions and interfering, but also when you have a ring. So if you have a ring and you, describe, and you have some wave function around the ring, the phase of the ring has to be single valued around the ring. And actually, this is also a very nice problem along with the Aharonov Bohm effect. This is also a very nice problem for qualifying exams or for final exams in um, quantum mechanics classes where you have people calculate what the states are of, 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 of an electron that's confined to move in a one-dimensional ring. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very pretty uh, problem. Um, OK, so what I want to do today is I want to give you two examples in superconductivity that come from two different regimes. Um, if you, if you, I, I, I hope I've said enough that you uh, have been reminded of why the phase, the amount of electrons that flow and the magnetic vector potential are all related to each other. If I actually uh, had a slide of the relevant Ginsburg-Landau equations, which I had, but I deleted it, um, you would see that the current that flows um, in a charged quantum fluid, such as a superconductor in Ginsburg-Landau theory, is equal to the charge of the carriers times h bar divided by the effective mass of the carriers times the density of the superfluid um, times the uh, gradient of the phase minus the magnetic vector potential. So that's a very important equation. The amount of current that flows, the phase gradient, and the magnetic vector potential are all really closely linked to each other. So I want to give you examples in two regimes. If you think of sort of a ring of, say, a superconductor in which this equation holds, um, and you imagine that you integrate this equation around a path in the center of the ring um, in which no current flows, you would find that the amount of flux inside that ring needs to be 
uh, an integral number of flux quanta. So HC over 2E or some integral number of HC over 2E. On the other hand, if you have a ring like that and you put a weak link in it, you'll find that not that the flux is quantized, but that what in superconductivity and condensed matter physics is called the fluxoid is quantized, which is that there's some combination of flux and supercurrent flowing that has to be quantized to keep the, uh, the, the um, phase of the wave function uh, single valued. And so I'll give you one example where we're looking at a weak link in a superconductor. But first I wanna give you an example where we're looking at a vortex in a 3D material. So if you take a ring such as this ring and you imagine just closing the center and expanding the outside and drawing a line somewhere in a bulk material um, and you have some currents flowing in a vortex-like pattern inside it, what you would find is that if you draw a loop sufficiently far away from where any current is flowing, what you would find is that the magnetic flux inside that loop has to be HC over the charge carrier times some integer. Okay, so vortices in 3D superconductors. Imagine that you have a superfluid. So first of all, imagine, just remind, just remind yourself what a vortex is in a classical fluid, air is a classical fluid, this is a vortex in a classical fluid. You know, there's some vorticity, the fluid flows faster and faster the closer you get to the center until the point where it can't flow that fast anymore and then there's a still region at the center um, and it can really have any amount of circulation. However, in a superconductor, because the phase of the order parameter or the wave function needs to be single valued modulo two pi, you can't have any amount of vorticity. You can't have any vorticity that is less than the amount that would give you a phase shift of two pi as you draw a loop around the center of that vortex. And because that, of that in superconductors in certain regimes, you get tubes of magnetic flux that penetrate the superconductor each of which carries a flux quantum HC over 2E uh, through the magnetic flux tube. And um, this image on the right here is a magnetic image of a YBCO surface showing you that all of those vortices are really carry exactly the same amount of flux. They all really look completely identical to each other. And you know we can do some math on the data and show you uh, that they all carry HC over 2E. Actually, just like large classical vortices in air can move around and cause a lot of dissipation, um, these nanoscale vortices and superconductors can move around and cause a little, lot of dissipation. In the 1980s, there was an effort to make a supercomputer at IBM that was made out of superconducting electronics. And people who worked there at the time told me that that effort was basically ruined by the fact that they couldn't control the fact that these vortices would uh, become metastable states in their superconducting circuits and hop around and completely ruin the superconductivity. Um, they would could not completely ruin it, but create enough noise in the circuit that the superconducting electronics wouldn't move. So just as uh, tornadoes are you know, very bad for human life, uh, similarly, superconducting vortices jumping around in superconducting circuits are bad for the smooth operations of the circuits. Um, let me talk a little bit about how you image these. So again, here's an example. I actually see that there are two messages in the chat. Um, ah, okay. If anyone sees a question show up in the chat, let me know. Um, okay, so this is obviously an image of a vortex in the air, and I wanna make two points about how we can view it. The first point is that there's contrast because of the water vapor in the air. The second point is that we are imaging it by using an optical camera, and it's a wonderful feature of light that light travels in pretty straight lines under these macroscopic conditions. And therefore you can be a long ways away from this feature and the light will be traveling at you in straight lines and you can still get a good image of the feature. Well, unfortunately, when we try to look at vortices and superconductors, we can't do that. So now imagine that instead of a vortex in air spreading across many miles, imagine that instead you had a vortex in a superconductor spreading across many nanometers um, and imagine that you're contrast mechanism, instead of being water vapor, imagine that your contrast mechanism was the fact that it's charged carriers that are in the fluid and that they're creating a magnetic field. So what would you expect to see in that case? You would have current swirling around the center. You would expect to see one of these magnetic flux tubes. And that's indeed what you see. 
This is an image of three vortices at yttrium barium copper oxide. This image was taken with a magnetic force microscope. That doesn't matter. Um, a micron above the surface of the sample. And you can see these three big blobs of magnetic flux. But again, unlike with a tornado or a hurricane, um, as you come in closer and closer to the surface, the magnetic fields get more and more and more concentrated until finally you reach the point where you start to see your image influenced also by other forces and topographical signals associated with the surface. You have to get really very, very close to the surface with a scanning probe in order to be able to detect these individual vortices and also in order to be able to quantify uh, both the amount of magnetic flux that they carry and also what their spatial extent is. Okay, so, um, so these are vortices in yttrium barium copper oxide. Um, and I want to uh, tell you about why um, we have found over the years that um, many exotic superconducting materials have are predicted to have exotic vortex behavior. Um, and I've, you know, I've spent probably a third to a half of my career looking for predicted exotic vortex behavior in exotic materials and usually not finding it, which has been a bit of a bummer, but that's, that's the way it is sometimes. So I want to tell you a little bit about quantum materials. Um, how many of you actually are condensed matter physicists? Okay, excellent. Um, so you can tell me if you agree with this assessment. You know, it's you you have to define quantum materials sometimes, right? What do you say when you're asked to define what a quantum material is? Um, well, one way to think about it again is that you know, uh, wave-like behavior is very manifest in electrons, and so um, if you have a material in which you can see wave-like behavior. Uh, uh, then um, you might think of that as being a quantum material. Um, another thing that is useful to know about materials in general is that they have band structure. And actually the ability to calculate the band structure of semiconductors and other uh, relatively simple materials at first is certainly one of the great achievements of the 1900s, right? Which led to a tremendous, uh, tremendous ability to engineer semiconductors and make a big difference in the world. But most materials are not simple materials. There's a lot of elements on the periodic table. And so you can, you can design different materials by taking many different combinations of elements and putting them in many different patterns of materials. An important part of the field of quantum materials is um, trying to calculate or guess um, either, either analytically or computationally or just guess through intuition what the properties of different materials might be um, and see if they have the desired behavior which usually they don't, but usually they do something interesting. Um, people have heard a lot about topology later, so I think most people consider any material that's topological to be a quantum material. Um, electrons are particles that have both spin and charge, and they're also fermions, and so anything where the fermion nature of an electron is important to the material could be called a quantum material. Um, Bob Laughlin, uh, my colleague at Stanford, um, likes to talk about the importance of solving the Hamiltonian from first principles and how if you write down the Hamiltonian of a material in which you have, you know, nuclei and electrons, and the first thing that happens is you find that the, you know, electrons and nuclei together form atoms and the atoms stick to each other. And by the time you uh, get down to the energy scale where uh, the electrons are doing things that deviate from the basic fact that they formed a solid, that's a very, very hard thing to calculate. So he kind of argues that anything that has a Hamiltonian um, and has uh, many uh, atoms in it should be called a quantum material, which would certainly be all materials. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then also there's uh, many materials that are more complicated because of uh, interactions and correlations. So we sometimes talk about weakly correlated materials or strongly correlated materials. One way to think about strongly correlated materials, so weakly correlated materials sort of means that, you know, the electrons uh, don't care that much what the other electrons are doing. And there's some wonderful approximations and, uh, you know, close, well-controlled well approximations you can make in that regime. There's another regime in which the electrons care a lot what all the other electrons are doing. And people sometimes compare that regime to, they sometimes compare the electrons to people. So if you think of this auditorium, for example, you know, all of you are strongly correlated. Right When you walked into the auditorium, it did not occur to you to sit in any seat that was already occupied, right? And so just like humans are strongly correlated, electrons too can be strongly correlated. And in the limit that they're strongly correlated, again, there are well-controlled approximations that you can make that give you a pretty good theory of the material. Unfortunately, many very interesting materials are moderately correlated. And so uh, 
Zlatko, Zlatko Tosanovic, uh, a wonderful condensed matter theorist who helped a lot of people understand a lot of things, I would say, and sadly um, died last decade, um, liked to compare the great challenge of the field to trying to cross a very, very wide river with one shore being uh, weakly correlated materials and one shore being strongly correlated materials. And people are constantly applying both of those regimes to materials where it's completely clear that it doesn't actually apply. And he likened it to just starting from the bank where you know you feel secure and paddling as hard as you can towards the middle. Um, and so, you know, all of these different effects that can happen lead to a really wonderful field and community in quantum materials, right? Because we have theorists who are trying to make appropriate approximations and guide us as to which materials may be interesting, what behavior might show up in materials that we haven't made yet or haven't studied yet, and um, you know, and what might be the explanation for unexpected behavior that we found in materials that we did make and study. Um, we also have computational people who are working as hard as they can to uh, actually be able to exactly calculate what's going on in some of these materials. And those of you who have read the lecture in which Feynman originally proposed a quantum computer, how many of you have read that lecture? Yeah, okay, good lecture, right? Yeah, so in that lecture where Feynman proposed a quantum computer, he actually talked about the primary, one of the primary purposes of such a computer is being to model quantum systems because it's so hard to model quantum systems with a classical com computer, you need a quantum material in order to do it. So I, I think many of us um, hope and anticipate um, that some of the first applications of early stage quantum computers and quantum simulators is actually specifically to simulate and model quantum materials and help us develop a better understanding and guide the search for quantum materials, new functionalities. And then we also have people who make materials and people like me who measure materials. Um, so it's really a worldwide community in which collaborations are kind of forming uh, very quickly. And um, someone I know, I'm not trying to uh, recruit anyone to switch from high energy theory or astrophysics to condensed matter theory exactly, but uh, someone I know who did do that um, as a graduate student did say that they really wanted to be a condensed matter theory because it's so much fun to have an idea and be able to talk to people who can implement your idea on a couple year time scale. Um, okay, so, uh, so now let's take these quantum materials where we there's a lot of things about them that we don't understand and go back to the question of vortices as a probe of the superconducting state. Over the years, we've um, searched for many different features. I'll just, this uh, slide is really for the experts. I'll just remind people. We've looked for uh, vortices with different flux quantization and strontium ruthenate, um, both with and without a parallel field, um, which is uh, expected for uh, multiband chiral superconductivity. Um, we haven't seen it. There was a measurement that did see it using uh, cantilever torque magnetometry in a carefully engineered small little cylinder. I think the author of that paper uh, has since published papers pointing out that what they saw was consistent with what's called a wall vortex um, and, and the effect doesn't occur in the bulk. Um, in yttrium barium copper oxide, we've looked for exotic flux quant uh, quantization that would result from a theory called the Vison theory of superconductivity um, in which superconductivity uh, would lead to HC over E uh, flux quantization in some regimes. Um, we've looked in, just to take a couple of other examples that are maybe less, uh, less core to the theories of superconductivity in both erbium nickel borocarbide and in cobalt uh, doped iron nictides and other iron nictides, um, we have found that um, the behavior of vortices as they move through this 3D system of the material is really, really strongly impacted by things like twin boundaries and other macroscopic uh, macroscopic, uh, I don't want to say defects, but macroscopic features that are found in the materials. And so when people think about what they're seeing in these materials, it's often one of the values of doing um, local imaging, precision local imaging, is that you can, you can kind of see whether your entire material is really behaving the same way in the way that you think that it is. Okay, so uh, my research group has looked at many vortices in many materials, and many other groups have also looked at many vortices in many materials. And I can count on one hand the number of times when something that might be an unquantized vortex was observed, unless there was a really obvious explanation for why it would be unquantized, like it was a fluxoid instead of a flux. 
And I'd be happy to talk about those examples if anybody wants. Um, so I really didn't pay that much attention to it in 2002 um, when Igor Babaev uh, wrote a paper called Vortices with Fractional Flux and Two-Gap Superconductors and an Extended Fideev Model. Um, the basic argument here is that if you have a material in which you don't just have one condensate, but you have like a condensate with two parts or two condensates or a two fluid model, but of course there would have to be some interaction. You know, but you might have a situation where you can have more than one order parameter uh, moving in the same space. Um, and in that case, you might be able to get a vortex in which, so suppose that you had a, I'm not sure how well the colors are showing up there, but that's supposed to be a red vortex on the left, a blue vortex on the right, and a purple vortex in the middle. So imagine you have a purple superfluid that's made up of a red superfluid and a blue superfluid, right? So the argument is that maybe you could get a vortex either in both of them at once, which would be the normal expectation, which would give you a fully quantized purple vortex, but maybe you could get a vortex just in the red fluid or just in the blue fluid. So that's the basic argument. And you know, if you work through the math of the two component um, ginsburg landau theory that Baba ever wrote down, um, which Professor Glasman and I were just discussing a few hours ago, um, you, you find that the um, flux that you would see in one of these partial vortices would depend on what the strength of that order parameter is relative to the strength of the total order parameter. Okay, so as I say in 2002, I didn't, I didn't honestly take this very seriously. Um, it just seems unlikely. First of all, many, many times we've seen vortices with flux HC over 2E. Um, second of all, you know, there are pretty good reasons to think theoretically that it might not be possible for the phases between the different bands to be unlocked. And Shmali and, and Kogan wrote a paper about this um, 10 years ago. Shmali and Kogan are two very, very sober, very, very solid theorists. In fact, I'll tell you a story about Vladimir Kogan. One of my students was in a qualifying exam and was getting really heavily quizzed by Mac Beasley, um, who's normally a very nice guy. The condensed matter people know Mac Beasley. Um, but he was really agitated on some point and he was quizzing her pretty hard. And she was answering correctly in my view, but I was you know, letting them play it out as one does. And, um, and then and he was still, he'd asked like the third or fourth time. And then she said, well, according to the paper by Vladimir Kogan, I'm right. And he said, oh, Vladimir Kogan, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, so when, Vlad, so when Shmalian and Kogan write a paper saying that theoretically, you know, the phases between different bands couldn't be unlocked, you tend to take it pretty seriously. Um, but Baba Ev proposed that a particular material might allow for fractional vortices, and that material is um, K-doped uh, barium iron arsenide. And, you know, I'm not going to go through all the band structure and stuff in this context, but the basic argument is that there's a particular value of the doping um, right around here at which there could be decent theoretical reasons to believe that if you were going to see this effect anywhere, maybe you would see it here. So my um, postdoc, Dr. Yusuke Aguchi, who is, uh, during the pandemic, became not only my postdoc, but also my lab manager, because I was busy being senior research officer, decided to take this seriously and got um, crystals of this material of a number of different dopings and looked at four different dopings of this material. And only in a doping of 0.77, um, he found these fractional vortices. So in that material, this is what a full vortex looks like. But in some cases, he saw that there were these fractional vortices that kind of calved off of the full vortices and migrated some distance away from them. And he found that this effect was strongest uh, near the critical temperature, which is where you might naively think that the interband coupling might be weakest, although I don't know if there's a strong theoretical justification for that. And then he found uh, that the fraction of flux that was carried in these fractional vortices kind of, uh, as I say, becomes larger close to the critical temperature. So this is really Yusuke Aguchi's work and it was published this year in Science. And this is a picture of uh, Dr. Aguchi, um, who by the way, uh, is an excellent speaker um, and will be on the job market this year. So if you're having any conferences on quantum materials, consider inviting him instead of me because he can give a very good talk about this work. So this is the latest example in which we've seen something, honestly, I would say really unexpected and really surprising, which is the possibility that it might be possible in a multi-band superconductor for the, there to be a 
complex order parameter in which the order parameter associated with different bands could acquire uh, different phases that would allow for a flux quantum to exist in one of them and not in the others. And of course, we'll be doing follow on tests that would confirm that this might exist and um, check out some of the uh, alternative hypotheses related to inhomogeneity, although we've seen this at many, many different regions uh, of the sample. Okay, so that was my first example, is that um, by looking at 3D vortices in many, many different materials, we can tell a lot about what the underlying superconducting state, most recently seeming to show that multiband superconductors may be able to develop different phases on different bands and have partial vortices. Um, now I wanna switch gears completely and talk to you about the other extreme uh, in which you have a weak link. Um, so uh, you've all heard of Joseph's injunctions. So let me just remind you, um, in a Joseph's injunction, you take two slabs of superconductor, here both labeled S, and you and each of them has, of course, a, you know, an order parameter which has both a magnitude and a phase. In this case, the left phase and the right phase and the phase difference between them phi is phi left minus phi right. And you bring them sufficiently close to each other. And you can imagine that if you just have vacuum in between them, you could get Cooper pairs tunneling from one side to the other side. And uh, Brian Josephson um, is you know, uh, very famous for having uh, pointed this out. And in the classic example of, um, and, then, and then if there's a different phase between these two blocks of superconductor, you get some current flowing between them and the current is a function of the phase. So the current is a function of the phase is called the current phase relation. And in the classic simple example that you learned about first or that you read about in Wikipedia, actually the Wikipedia article on macroscopic quantum phenomena says, uh, we assert without proof <laughs> that the current phase relation is, uh, is I equals the critical current times the sine of the phase between them. Okay. So that's called a sinusoidal current phase relation. Now, uh, you might have heard about Majorana's, which were very topical for the past decade, uh, Majorana modes as being potentially a method to do quantum computing. And I'm not really going to explain how that works, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards if you want. It's the method that Microsoft is pushing really hard for their quantum computing. And because Microsoft is pushing it really hard for their quantum computing, we have access to some really outstanding samples that would never have been fabricated if Microsoft weren't spending you know, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars trying to build a quantum computer that's based on Majorana's. Um, so uh, normally, if you have a Joseph's injunction, you can imagine that the current phase relation has to be two pi periodic, right? Because how could it not be? Um, but there are ways where if you have a Majorana mode, you could potentially get a four pi periodic current phase relation. And that's what initially got me into looking at these things was thinking that we might be able to see the four pi periodic current phase relation associated with Majorana's. I'm not very optimistic about ever seeing that. And so I'm not gonna really talk more to you about it today, but it let us test some really cool things about, um, about uh, Joseph's injunctions. So now, Imagine that you have two superconductors here and here, and you bring them close to each other. This image is an image from this really wonderful paper by Golubov, Kupriyanov, and Ilichev, um, who do this incredibly long survey of all of the different kinds of junctions that are possible to make, um, or that were known to be possible to make in 2004, including some that nobody knew how to make. Um, and uh, so imagine that you bring, so this, this figure is from that paper, which is really wonderful. Uh, the figure is kind of confusing because this axis, the X axis is, is space and the Y axis is a little bit of a weird mixing of space and energy. Um, but just think of it as a energy axis if you like. So um, imagine that you have a Cooper pair. Uh, oh, okay, so imagine that you bring these two superconductors close to each other and now you, you could put a vacuum in between them and if you put a vacuum in between them, you could have Cooper pairs tunneling from one to the other, right? But now imagine that instead you put in something like a semiconductor or a normal metal 
um, in which you can have quasi-particle excitations uh, near the Fermi level. So if you do that, you have the Cooper pair coming, and you, could you can imagine that you have an electron that's approaching a boundary, and the electron, when the electron reaches the boundary of the superconductor, it can't go into the superconductor, um, except by becoming a Cooper pair and reflecting a hole. And that's called Andrea reflection. And if you write down the equations associated with that, uh, what you find is that there are some quasi-particle bound states in the reason between the two superconductors, and those bound states are called Andreev bound states. Okay, so you can get from one superconductor to the other only by going through Andreev bound states. The energy, again, if you write down the relevant equations, the energy of those bound states depends on the phase between the two superconducting leads, and it depends on it like this. There's an electron-like state and a hole-like state, and they cross, and then there's an avoided level crossing, and then um, the current is the derivative of the energy with respect to phase, so the current of the two states looks like the red line and like the blue line. Okay, so that is the current phase relation. Um, and then here's a more detailed expression of what the current phase relation looks like from a series of papers in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And um, whereas I told you that for a conventional Joseph's injunction, if you want, the current phase relation is sinusoidal, this is clearly not at all sinusoidal, right? This looks, it's not, it's not a sawtooth, it's got this it's got this very characteristic like roll over here. So it's not exactly a sawtooth, but it's sawtooth-like, it's very skewed. It's not at all sinusoidal. It's completely different than the current phase relation that you would get if you had the classic sinusoidal justice and current phase relation. So this kind of current phase relation is um, basically an indication that you have Josephson coupling between two superconductors uh, through a region in which you get this kind of Andreev bound state. Okay, um, so we wanted to look for this. Actually, uh, Bineker wrote a really beautiful paper called uh, Three Universal Signatures of Mesoscopic Superconductors, something like that is the title. Um, and, and one of them, he really argues for the importance of looking for this, for this perfect, um, perfect skewed current phase relation that is the signature of transmission through a single Andreev bound state, a single Andreev mode uh, in, a, uh, in a clean, short adiabatic junction. Um, so uh, let me go back to our squids. Um, some of the data I showed you before was taken with squids, some with hull probes, some with magnetic force microscopes, but now I just wanna talk about squids. So we actually developed these squids not for imaging superconductors and not for studying current phase relations. We, we developed them for studying um, persistent currents um, in uh, normal metal rings, um, something that Jack Harris uh, knows a lot about. We both worked on it together a decade ago. We both worked on it uh, in parallel a decade ago. Um, but the main point is that we have a superconducting quantum interference device, which is a very sensitive detector of magnetic field. Don't worry about how it's actually fabricated. Um, this uh, detector of magnetic field has a pickup loop and we measure the total magnetic flux through the pickup loop. And it has a field coil, so we can apply a local magnetic field by running a current through the field coil. Um, so the spatial resolution of these things depends on the size of the pickup loop. Our smallest are about 0.3 microns, 300 nanometers. Some people make some using a completely different technology called squid on chip that are as small as 100 nanometers. And so if you imagine taking this loop and you're measuring the total magnetic flux through the loop. So imagine that this loop is fabricated on the edge of a chip. Actually, this is a better view of it. So imagine that you're measuring the total flux through this loop and you take this loop and put it over the surface of a sample and scan it back and forth across the surface of the sample. You're basically measuring the magnetic field produced by the sample convolved with that pickup loop, okay? So this is an image of a vortex, which is kind of like a measurement of something like the point spread function of our pickup loop. Okay, so we can do magnetometry where we just scan it back and forth and measure the total magnetic field um, captured by the pickup loop. We can also do this thing called susceptometry where we apply a current through this field coil and measure the total magnetic flux that gets captured through the pickup loop. 
Um, and that's how we're going to study these current phase relations. That's the method that we're going to use for studying the current phase relations. Um, so again, this is a pretty typical squid. Here's a pickup loop. This one's smaller than we'd probably use for current phase relations. And to apply a local magnetic field, we pass a current through this big outer loop. When I say big outer loop, in this case, it's about a micro. OK, so now what we do is we take a ring shown here in gold and let that ring by, be interrupted by some weak link whose current phase relation we want to measure. We want to know how much current flows across that weak link as a function of the phase difference across the link. By now, if you didn't before, you know very well how to apply a phase gradient across the link, right? You apply a magnetic field, and that causes current to flow and causes the phase gradient to form across the link. So what we do is we put a current through the field coil that applies a flux to the ring, and then that current in the field coil uh, creates a flux through a pickup, uh, uh, sorry, a current through a field coil applies a flux to the ring. That's the ring that we're measuring down there, the gold ring. And that causes a current to flow in the ring. How much current flows in the ring depends on the current phase relation of the weak link. And then that current that flows in the ring in turn creates a flux, a, creates a magnetic flux through a pickup loop, which is part of a squid. OK, so we measure the current in the ring versus the applied flux. And then just by applying multiplicative factors of the very calculable mutual inductances, we then determine the current phase relation of the loop. Actually, this technique, um, we thought we'd uh, invented this technique, but it turns out it was actually invented circa 1970 in Cornell. Um, and um, it just was never widely applied. Because in those days, the superconducting loops were so big that they had so much self-flux that it was really impossible to extract what, what this actually was. So it's only the development of uh, mesoscopic uh, fabrication techniques that let us, you know, 40 years later, rediscover the same technique that was actually published in a very nice applied physics letter almost 50, not quite 50, but almost 50 years earlier. OK, and so one of the things that I really like about using scanning squids is that we can do this on many, many devices. So we can have a whole array of rings, and we can take our uh, pickup loop field coil pair, and we can measure the current phase relation in one device, and then we can measure it in another device, and then we can compare different devices. It's helpful to be able to compare different devices. It's also helpful to be able to make uh, measurements on devices that are fabricated in any old sample. Like you might ask, well, why don't you just fabricate your device in your squid? It's hard. We couldn't fabricate uh, most of the devices that we study inside our squid. It's really helpful to have them detached from each other. OK, so the particular um, samples that I want to tell you about that we've studied quite a bit for the last uh, seven years, actually, are these aluminum indium arsenide aluminum nanowire junctions. Um, they're actually very studied because they have spin orbit coupling, which is important for Majoranas, but not important for what I'm going to show you here at all. So just ignore that. The main thing that we like about them is that they have these very beautiful epitaxial interfaces. Um, just very, very clean materials. And also the indium arsenide is a semiconductor and is gate tunable. So the basic idea is that you have aluminum and then you have indium arsenide and then you have aluminum. And you'll recognize this as being the same uh, setup that I told you when I said we have a superconductor and then we have something that can support quasi particles and then we have another superconductor. Okay. Um, and what we find is we gate tune the semiconductor is that uh, below a backgate voltage of minus 2.75, we don't see any, so we're, I'm showing you the current in the ring as a function of the phase that we've applied to the junction across the ring. Um, and uh, below this backgate voltage, we see nothing. It's just flat, flat, flat. And that's because uh, there's no carriers in the semiconducting nanowire at that low of a gate voltage. Then as we change the gate voltage, we find that we start to get a, a current phase relation that indicates that a small amount of superconductivity, actually the superconductivity, the magnitude of the superconductivity that you'd expect to be associated with a single mode, given what we know about the gap of this material, starts to flow through the ring. Um, and you can see that in some cases it looks pretty sinusoidal, and in other cases it has this like very skewed shape 
And then weirdly, it's some places it gets this like backward skewed shape. So again, this is the part of the talk that's really for the experts. Um, but if you look at, for example, this mode, you can see that it really very beautifully fits the Binecker formula for transmission through a single mode with high transmission at a very small but still finite temperature. Um, so that means that we can tune this into a state where the current through the junction is carried by a single mode with perfect transmission. Um, and I was, I thought that was, I, it was pretty cool. I did not expect to see such a skewed current phase relation. There are other um, current phase relation papers in liter literature where it's just like barely vis visibly skewed from a sine wave. In here, it's actually consist really consistent with, with perfect transmission. Um, we also see these backwards things. And here I'm just gonna zoom in on this backward skewed current phase relation. And I'm just gonna assert without really getting into it that this is uh, an indication of a Josephson current through a correlated quantum level, um, as was originally predicted by these theorists, Vecino, Martin, Rodero, and Yayati. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing their names right, but they calculated this back in 2003, and we think we saw it in 2018. Um, so that's that was kind of cool. OK. Um, and then we verified that we really are seeing the tuning through a, a correlated level um, by uh, building a different structure um, in which we could tune the ratio of the uh, charging energy to the coupling from the gates. And our collaborators at um, Microsoft Station Q actually did some very specific modeling of what the mode structure in these indium arsenide nanowires might look like. And it agreed kind of qualitatively with what we're seeing. Yeah, so we're pretty sure that we, we really saw that. Um, yeah, so the modeling of the physical mode structure was done by Andrei Antipov and Roman Luchin at Microsoft Station Q in Santa Barbara. Okay, and so just to summarize on the current phase relations of the aluminum indium arsenide nanowires, we found that they're gate tunable. You know, we found that we can tune it into where there's a single transmitting mode. We found that there's a region where we can tune it into something that's uh, consistent with perfect transmission through a single mode. And we also found that we can see visible effects of states with charging energy, which I initially thought was some evidence of disorder in the wire. But after Andre and Roman did their calculations, I realized that it's actually exactly what you'd expect for a wire of this shape because of the finite energy levels inside the wire. Um, I want to leave time for questions. So I hurried a bit through the end there, but I'm happy to take any questions on it. Um, the initial work on the current phase relations in my group was done primarily by Eric Spanton. Um, and later generation experiments were done by Zheng Shui and Sean Hart. Um, and the work that I showed you on the unquantized vortices was done by Yasuki Iguchi. Um, the squids were different, different data that I showed you today was, some of it was done with squids that were fabricated at UC Denver by Martin Huber. And some of it was done with squids that were fabricated in Yorktown Heights by Gerald Gibson and Mark Ketchen and a whole giant team that they supervised in the IBM clean room. And the indium arsenide devices were from Copenhagen and the nictide single crystals were from uh, Vadim Grunenko. So, and I'm very grateful to my funding agents and also to you for inviting me to talk. These are our two lab pets. This is a squid drawing that one of my students did. Talented artist, right? Yeah. And so see what the squid's holding? It's a meter stick. It's a measuring stick. Yeah. <laughs> so it's our, so this squid is doing precision measurements in its own squid-like way. Um, and this is an image of the magnetic fields from a magnetotactic bacteria, which is our other big lab pet. Okay, thank you. Pam, so for the benefit of the um, people on Zoom, I'd like you to ask questions with the microphone. What's that? Okay. And also the people on Zoom can put questions in the chat. Right. If you're on Zoom, uh, you can add questions to the chat. Jack. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk until I have the microphone. That's okay. <laughs> um, so you, uh, thank you very much for the talk and this super cool to see all this stuff. You mentioned that with the indium arsenide wire, um, this wasn't your main motivation, but there had been discussion about a four pi uh, periodic current phase relationship. Do you think that's out there somewhere? Do you think it's uh, feasible or will, will it be observed eventually? Um, I think it's feasible. Um, let me go back to that and say a little bit more about it. 
since you asked. Um, right. So what happens here is that each of these branches, the electron branch and the whole branch, has um, two uh, can have two quasi particles in it, spin up and spin down, um, and um, uh, and um, that is part of what enables the system to stay in, it ground, in its ground state as it goes through this avoided level crossing. Um, if you have a system in which, for some reason, you can't have both spins, um, that is essentially what a Majorana mode is. Um, and that would give you a four pi periodic current phase relation um, uh, because um, instead of having this avoided level crossing, you would have to stay in either the red state or the blue state. And that would give you the four pi periodic current phase relation. Um, however, uh, it would still be possible through a process called quasi-particle poisoning to jump between the branches. So how quickly, so whether or not you could measure fast enough to see that four pi periodic current phase relation requires you to stay in this state that's not the ground state. And so it depends on how fast the quasi-particle poisoning times are. There's some evidence that the quasi-particle poisoning times in plausible devices might be large enough to see this four pi periodic current phase relation. Um, and I think the version of the experiment that we would actually do if we were ever doing experiments on devices that we actually thought would have that <laughs> um, would, um, uh, would be to actually look at the noise. Um, and um, you know the noise, the noise between these two different options is looks very different. Um, so either you know you either are or you are not able to switch back and forth between these two different states and see noise peaks. Um, but first, you'd have to build a system in which you expected to see that. And in order to do that, you would need both the gap that we get here from the aluminum, and you need a Zeeman coupling, which in the ideal version of these devices you'd get by having europium sulfide epitaxial along with uh, aluminum epitaxial. And uh, it's just it's just a very, very hard problem to get the Hamiltonian that has both the gap and the Zeeman energy by, by heterostructure engineering. Yeah, and apologies to all the non-condensed matter people in the audience for whom I was probably just talking total nonsense. Yeah. So I, I want to ask a question about the uh, the Babay of uh, the two mm -hmm. two fluid uh, superconductor models. So you, somehow uh, the phases there's no like Josen coupling between the two fluids that locks the phase. That, that's the assumption. Yeah, it's and, not that there's no Josephson coupling. It's that the Josephson coupling isn't strong enough to lock the phase. Okay. And so there's a question of what is the correct form of the Josephson coupling in a Ginsburg-Landau model that's derived from a band structure. Okay, so uh, good. So my question is, so if you have a vortex in one fluid and not the other, is there some simple intuition for why the fraction is sort of the ratio, the, the fraction of the density? I didn't... Yeah. <clears throat> Um, it's basically uh, how many carriers are in that fluid. So if you have, so if you have a two fluid model, and now I'm going to try to give an answer that is understandable to everybody. Um, if you have a two fluid model in which you have, let's say you have the red superconductor and the blue superconductor, and um, together they make a purple superconductor, and the flux is quantized in the purple superconductor. Um, so the amount of flux that's carried if you just have a twist in one of the superconductors is the amplitude of that superconductor. So the density of superconducting electrons in that superconductor divided by the total density of superconducting electrons. So in other words, if you have a two band model and you have 20% of your electrons in the red band and 80% of your electrons in the blue band, then your flux would be 20% of a flux quantum. Okay. Steve I, looks skeptical. Well, I, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I understand that's the claim. I was just hoping for, I'm still not quite seeing why that is, but we can save it for private conversation. Well, I think it would, so it would depend on the, um, it would depend on the uh, fraction of the electrons that are flowing in each of the two vortices. 
right? So if you have 20% of the electrons are flowing in a vortex and the other 80% are not flowing in the vortex, you get 20% of the flux quantum. And I think your question might be, so what, are, what actually happens to the other 80% of the flux? Because eventually, you know, something has to happen to all of it. And the, and the answer is that you actually get like a 20% flux quantum and an 80% flux quantum. And the hypothesis is just that they can be separated by very large distances. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, Professor Glassman. <laughs> yeah, which forced me to ask uh, a follow-up question. Uh, so, so this equation uh, somehow assumes that there are no length scales, so to speak, right? So, so my question is that experimentally, did anybody measure the penetration depth and coherence and correlation radius, coherence radius? And yes. Is it type one, type two, or anything else? We measured the penetration depth. And so my belief is that the penetration depth is larger than the coherence length because we are seeing vortices. We couldn't measure the coherence length, but we could measure the penetration depth. Um, we can measure the penetration depth in two ways. One is by seeing what the spatial extent of the vortex is. Um, and the other is by measuring what the um, uh, what the response, how, how much the sample shields the flux from the field coil and a field coil pickup loop mutual inductance style measurement. Um, and, uh, um, and the penetration depth from those two methods was consistent with each other. Um, and what we found is that the vortices, these vortices could be the, the sort of the baby vortices, the fractional calf vortices could be many penetration depths away from any other vortex. So that's that's the part that makes it plausible that this, that's the part that's hard to explain in any model other than the Babayev model. Okay. And it, it's a film or it's a thick sample? Sorry? It's a thick sample. It's a thick sample. It's a thick sample. Okay, it's, so a it's, thick sample it's really yeah. what it's lying. Supposed to. It's a thick sample, and I don't have any um, knowledge of whether the vortices reconnect down below the surface or not. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Question in the chat. Let's see. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Yes, I agree. So the question is whether spatial anisotropy is expected or has been seen in the vortices of a superconductor with nodes. And there have been uh, BCS-based naive expectations of starfish-shaped vortices and cuprates. And actually, you can get starfish-shaped vortices just from the band structure. So one of the most famous early imaging of vortices was done by Harold Hess at Bell Labs using scanning tunneling microscopy. He was also the first person to use a scanning hall probe to magnetically image a vortex by a technique that wasn't fitter decoration. Um, and actually, he sees these very beautiful, like six fold symmetry. I would call them more like snowflakes than like starflakes, uh, than uh, starfish. But he sees these very beautiful six fold symmetric vortex patterns associated with the um, with a combination of the vortex lattice structure and the band structure of the material that he was looking in, niobium diselenide. Um, I am not aware um, of um, of uh, of people seeing um, uh, that kind of structure in magnetic imaging of vortices. Um, I'm not sure where the camera is. I'm trying to like look at you. <laughs> you you is yeah okay. So you have so I'm not aware of people seeing that kind of uh, non non azimuthal symmetry in looking at vortices magnetically. And I think it makes sense that it's much harder to see that magnetically because the magnetic fields coming from the currents is very long range. So, you know, if you have a subtle variation in how much current is flowing, it would lead to a much more subtle variation in how much magnetic field you have at different yeah. regions. It's just the nature of the current flowing and averaging over all the currents that it tends to smooth itself out into a cylinder pretty quickly. I'm not aware of that having been seen with magnetic imaging, but from scanning tunneling microscopy, definitely. Yeah, and also I think from various forms of scattering off across a across off of a vortex lattice. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Cameron again.